Joining us now, we have Dylan Radigan of Tasty Trade and many other things. Great to see you, Dylan. Good to see you, Dylan. Nice to see you. Hi, Sager. Can I make right. one quick comment to you, Sager? Yes. I think you. I, I, I agree with your, I, I understand your analysis and I understand its logic, but I think you're missing a critical piece. Okay. You know who's behind this? I'm talking about the whole Rogan, Neil Young thing. Yes. Joe Rogan. If Joe Rogan gets canceled, he collects on the Spotify contract. He's able to launch an independent media company, which is much bigger than what he is on Spotify. In other words, the person who benefits the most from being attacked on Spotify is Joe Rogan. <laughs> That's a good he point. Because can collect the payout. Remember, being on Spotify, if anything, makes his audience smaller. The best thing that could happen to Joe Rogan would be to get canceled by Spotify. <laughs> well, that's true. Because then he would launch an independent media like Breaking Points. He would have good. a bigger audience than he has on Spotify. And he would collect the, the Spotify payout. I think Neil Young is the seed capital behind <laughs> Joe Rogan. Independent media. <laughs> you know, Dylan, you're you're you've, you're starting to make some real you've sense. You cracked here, the, the yeah, conspiracy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dylan Rogan yeah. is the puppet master of all of this. Yeah. Um, well, it's a great point too because it just shows you their efforts to cancel him and mm -hmm. and whatever. I mean, it's They're it's going to do the opposite. It's, it's only making people talk more about Joe Rogan, right. putting him more in the public eye, and probably benefiting him and Spotify um, most of all. Even though I know on a personal level he does not enjoy no, any of this he's, he's, <laughs> whatsoever. It's not good for him. Um, Dylan, let's go ahead and throw this tear sheet up on the screen. I wanted to get you on to talk about a whole range of things, but let's start with uh, what's going on with the markets, which have been kind of all over the place. We've got this headline that just came out uh, end of last week, weaker U.S. Consumer Consumer spending, rising inflation pose a dilemma for the Fed. We've been talking here, and of course, the Fed has been signaling very strongly. Um, they're going to hike interest rates. They're going to try to wind down quantitative easing. So just give us the, the Dylan Radigan perspective of what's going on in the economy and the markets right now. Sure. Well, again, first, some context. It's January 31st. This will be the end of the worst month overall for the S&P 500, for the big index, since March of 2020. So the, the last time we had a big, consistent, month-long sell-off was the month that the pandemic started, <clears throat> politically anyway, you know, uh, bio, you know, biologically it was happening months before, but politically it went into effect in this country in March of 2020. We've just completed the worst month in the U.S. stock market since that month. That's pretty amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> because... There have been a lot of negative events in this country, not to mention all the lockdowns, April, May, June, you know, there, there are men, the, the, all the variants that have come. So I'm actually surprised that the markets have performed as well as they have uh, between March of 2020 and January of 2022. That's the first thing. Why have they performed so well? We all know trillions from the U.S. government supporting generally very large businesses along with some, and in, in, in my opinion, not enough, particularly for small business owners and for independent entrepreneurs, but certainly plenty of direct assistance to certain parts of the economy. Um, so it's not a surprise to see the market come back down, one, as a result of the increase in stock prices between the lows in March and April of last year, or two years ago now, um, and this month, one, so valuation, ease, give back. You mentioned, Crystal, the interest rate hikes, which will be happening this year. So the market likes to price in the future, not the past. And so you're seeing repricing uh, across the board in anticipation of an overall higher cost for anybody uh, to borrow money. Uh, so in higher interest rates, the run in valuations, and then the never ending sort of saber rattling and, and idiocy in the geopolitical theater. You put those three things together, a down month where, you know, I know some of the super names, like, you know, whether it's, you know, Robin Hood is a, was as down 90% or 80%. Some of these sort of uh, meme or meme related stocks have been annihilated, but the overall index is, or you know, 10% plus minus uh, in terms of the decline. I think what when you get the complacency of a market that seems to only go up, and then you get any indication that maybe the market might also go down a little bit, 
it is emotionally more alarming for people than it really should be. Um, so anyway, that's the, the, the context. Yeah. You do have inflation. We can talk about it. You, we do have rising rates. We can talk about it. Companies' earnings, honestly, are coming out ahead of expectations. Four out of five companies are beating expectations right now. Granted, they manipulate the expectation to accomplish right. that, but all the same, they are exceeding expectations. So on the earnings side, market's fine. On the rate side, the market's adjusting to reality. On the valuation side, this has been a long time coming. So this is the question I have here, Dylan, about the eventual possibility of a crash. I saw news over the weekend that Goldman Sachs yesterday saying, we have been averaging $1 trillion worth of puts per day against the market. This is the largest on record. First, if you could explain for the audience what exactly that means. But, I mean, that seems very concerning to me that there's a lot of money to be made if the market does crash. Well, again, remember, a put is simply a bet that the market is going to go lower. Mm -hmm. However... When they say there's a trillion dollars worth of puts, those puts are not necessarily new positions that people are buying, betting the market will go lower. Mm. Many of those positions are hedge positions that were in place before the market sold off that had to be adjusted because they became losing positions. So a headline. So the issue with a headline like that, Sager, is one, mm -hmm. the overall market is much bigger and there's more money than ever. So a trillion dollars sounds like a lot of money, but a trillion sure. dollars today in the global financial market is not the same thing as a trillion dollars in 1975 or 85 or 95 or even 05 or 15. Um, so the number is not as big as you might think. And that number is much more a natural reflection of reflection of repricing mm losing positions because of the sell-off. In other words, at first you're like a trillion dollars worth of puts. That means people are just bet a trillion dollars that the stock market's going to go lower. Right. Right. Which sounds terrible, but it's not, that's not what Goldman Sachs is saying. They're saying the value of the puts traded is a trillion dollars, but they're not saying that the reason those puts are trading is as a directional bet on lower prices for the stock market. It's a refunction of the overall volatility because we've had these plus and minus two, three, four percent days that creates lots of people that get inside out. Like, you know, if you're you end up down, if you're leveraged and something goes down four percent in the morning, you may have to recalibrate everything that you do only to see the stock market come back in the afternoon and everything you just did in the morning is now pointless. But it's still you recorded all that volume. And so I would say that, th that those numbers are much more a reflection of the overall velocity and volume and activity in the market mm -hmm. and less an indication of an explicitly negative sentiment. Got it. Good. Do you think that we have asset bubbles that, if popped, could create a very dangerous situation for the economy? economy? Well, the, the, the only thing, to be very clear, the only thing that creates real danger for the economy, when whether it's an asset bubble or whatever it is, is if there's extreme leverage. So if there are $100 at risk for every real dollar that exists, which is what happened in 2008 and 2009, and then that $1 goes down by 50%, so you now go from $1 to 50 cents on the real dollar, which then means that you go from $100 to $50, you're down $50, and now you have to pay $50 with 50 cents, which is what happened. I don't know if that made sense to you guys, but that's what happened in 2008 and 9. Mm. That's a disaster. Mm. If you believe the reporting from the Federal Reserve and the central banks, if you believe the capital requirements, if you believe the standards that are in place post-2009 to restrict leverage, right? So the question is not, what is the asset price? The question is, how much money has been borrowed against the underlying asset price? Got it. So if I have $100 worth of Robinhood stock and I borrow $1,000 using my $100 of Robinhood stock as collateral, and then Robinhood stock goes down to 10 or 12 or wherever it is right now, that thousand dollars that I borrowed is a huge problem because I only have ten dollars. It's a total, that's the annihilation, right? That's too big mm -hmm. to fail. But if I have the hundred dollar position in Robinhood and my leverage is one to one or one and a half, and my leverage is lower, 
the damage to the overall economy is much less. And so the honest answer is I don't really know, and I don't actually think anybody really knows what the aggregate, what the total amount of leverage is in the financial marketplace. And without understanding how much leverage exists, it's very difficult for anybody to understand the potential con catastrophic consequences for the economy. Now, with that said, we know that the entire value of all the houses in the United States is used as a basic collateral for the banks to lend trillions of dollars. We know that the equity, this equity value of stocks and bonds that are held in the financial markets is base collateral for lots of borrowing. We know when those asset prices, whether it's bond prices, stock prices, or housing prices, go down in value quickly and significantly, which they have not done, by the way. I understand what there's the horror show I can point to, you know, these some of these super tech stocks that have been creamed, but the overall asset prices in the equity and bond markets are lower, but they have by no means crashed. But when you get a major down pricing in asset prices, housing, stocks, bonds, where it goes down 10, 20, 30, 40% quick, that should be very alarming and concerning because then it, 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 it certainly, if there is leverage, it will create a massive problem. Mm -hmm. So you have to assume, Crystal, the risk is there. Yeah. But at this point, you're not seeing explicit evidence of the consequence of that risk in the form of catastrophic um, removal of credit availability from the banks. You know, gotcha. where, when you get an asset bubble collapse and you have a cat and you have a catastrophic issue, the way that plays out is bank lending to individuals, small businesses, medium businesses, and large businesses goes away. And when bank lending goes away, all business stops happening. That's what happened in 2008 and nine. That's the risk that you're talking about, Crystal, when you ask about the asset bubble. Right now, we're not seeing that yet. Sorry, go ahead, Sydney. No, no, no. I was saying this has been uh, very helpful, Dylan. Uh, Go one ahead, other thing, one Dylan, question. while we have yeah. you, that I wanted to ask you about because you have unique visibility yeah. into. I mentioned in your introduction you got your hands on a whole lot of things. Um, PPE, media mogul, um, biomedical. One thing I didn't mention is that you're also involved with a company that helps book travel around the world, which kind of gives you unique visibility into how people are feeling about coronavirus right now. Are they panicked? Are they traveling? Are they not traveling? Are they staying home? What are they doing? And so from your vantage point there, um, how does the behavior of people match up with some of the headlines that we see from the media? Yeah, I mean, it's super interesting. And, and again, just for context, the company's called Hotel Planner. I'm on the board of directors. I've been involved with the company since 2013. The company's actually going uh, public uh, in February on the NASDAQ. And so there's been a lot of, act imagine trying to go public with a travel company in the middle of the <laughs> pandemic. Oh my God. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the, so, but the interesting thing to your point, Crystal, is you have the political narrative and the media narrative on the virus and the pandemic. And then you have what actual human beings actually do uh -huh. when they do or do not book travel. And obviously, for sure, March 2020, April 2020, May 2020, June 2020, talk about catastrophic. You're, you're talking about vacants, you know, hotels with zero rooms booked. Wow. Not 10, not 10%, wow. zero, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're talking about 90% cancellation rates. The interesting thing coming through 2000, early going a year later now, spring of 2021, Delta variant, there was a downtick, but not nearly the downtick that you might have thought, because Delta was obviously the big first big, oh my God, this is never going to end. And then with Omicron, the gap has never been wider between the, the narrative on the virus and the behavior. In other words, people are traveling, people are moving, people are, you know, maybe for, I, I, again, I don't know what the health consequences of this are or may be or the hospital um, capacity constraints, which I think is the primary concern that people have with all this. But I, I do find it interesting that the longer this goes on, that the bigger the gap between travel behavior, which continues to be consistent, and it's the reason Hotel Planner 
can go public, right? It's when if people say, well, hang on, what's going on? I thought there's a pandemic. And then, then they talk to investors and they say, well, look at the numbers. You know, we're, we're, revenues are at a record, <laughs> okay? And so there's a huge gap right now between behavior and um, narrative, I guess, when it comes to the pandemic. I would say the biggest of the pandemic, you know, and I think a lot of us socially understand, you look around and see that people, you know, I, I, there was some comedian that was saying, you know, anyway, the, the, the people are, do, people yeah. are not staying home. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. Makes sense. Dylan, it's always wonderful to have your insights. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, I Dylan. Come back and join us again. Thanks for I, the wisdom. I love that. All right. Thanks, guys. Our Absolutely, pleasure. Take man. care. All right. Bye. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, we really appreciate it. We appreciate your support, you know, every day. You know, this Rogan thing is always a reminder. They can turn on you at any time. I talked about Dan Bongino. Look, not the biggest Bongino fan. The guy was literally taken down for questioning the efficacy of cloth masks, which the CDC just did the other day. And then technically they banned him for some fake reason. What, <laughs> you're posting on a second channel. This can happen to anybody. We talk about controversial stuff all the time. We also post our stuff on Spotify. Will our stuff be getting misinformation labels? Also these new things, rules that they've put out, Crystal. Different ways, creators double speak, you know, whatever, basically in order to say they're gonna develop probably some sort of strike system. Um, the way that YouTube possibly has. We can only rely on you. So thank you for your support. Uh, it's what drives both of us every day, both fulfilling the promises that we make to our premium subscribers, but also you are the only people who make this show possible, who make it so we could cover all of the things down there the mainstream media are not telling you and are really gaslighting so many millions of people. So thank you to those who can, and if you can't support us, it really means a lot because it helps our mission. And I see, you know, I see why we were, we were prescient in a way, why we designed it this way, yeah. um, and specifically for this reason. Yeah, and even if you're not, you know, blatantly canceled, yeah. right? Like the algorithmic screwing, all of oh, those yeah. things. Anytime I talk just, about school masking, it's like. Yeah. yeah. So um, we appreciate you guys. Thank yeah. you for making it possible to do this. Thank you for giving us absolutely no fear or concern about what the consequences of covering topics that may be uncomfortable might be, or having on guests that might be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, we love you guys. You enable us to do what we do here. Have a wonderful day, and we will see you right back here tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.